In 1995, a videotape of home porn goes missing from the home of Motley Crue drummer Tommy Lee and actress Pamela Anderson. The leaked video becomes a worldwide sensation. Turn back the clock to 1995, a time when musicians earned big from album sales. TV shows had massive influence, and a wealthy man was about to learn a tough lesson for not paying his workers who knew too much about his house. In the midst of a big bedroom makeover, Carpenter Rand Gothier tries to put together a bed frame, but the loud sounds of a couple making love upstairs distract him. He decides to take a break and heads to his van, searching through a box for a tube of Ben Gay, accidentally revealing books like Masonic Rituals, writes the Bhagavad Gita. Showing us he's on a quest for knowledge, or for the moment though, his quest is more about his job. The house belongs to Tommy Lee, famous as the drummer of Motley Crue what Tommy owns, a big fluffy sheepdog, and lots of ideas for the room. What he lacks, pants. As shown in the first episode of the series, Tommy prefers to spend a lot of his time with very little clothing, which means a lot of time spent showing off Sebastian Stan's abs, complete with Tommy's iconic mayhem tattoo. Tommy's ideas include moving the bed frame so he can watch his partner shower from the bedroom not minding that Anne just finished securing it to the floor where they initially agreed. Rand mentions it's possible, but will cost more. Money is no object, Tommy says, a phrase he seems to use often. However, outside Rand and another worker, Lonnie, share their experiences. Tommy was supposed to pay them half the job's cost up front, yet Rand is missing nearly $8,000 and Lonnie about $15,000. But Tommy seems too caught up in enjoying life to bother with such mundane things as writing checks. The story first shows us Tommy and his glamorous wife, Pam, while Rand and Lonnie are sharing their frustrations. Typical rock stars, Lonnie comments under his breath. The narrative then follows Rand back to his home, highlighting the financial strain he's under due to this project. He adds some newly arrived overdue bills to an already growing stack in his simple apartment he finds out his cable service has been disconnected because he hasn't paid the bill for three months, leading him to punch a wall in frustration and then cool his injured hand with a bag of frozen peas, despite trying to distract himself with the TV listings in the newspaper and briefly mentioning Tommy's famous wife, Pamela Anderson from Baywatch. He ends up watching an adult film on VHS, awkwardly managing with his bandaged hand. The situation deteriorates the next day when Tommy uses Rand to show off his grand plans for the love nest. He's building to his friends, listing extravagant features like a stripper pole, an open shower, walls covered in shag carpet, a Chinese swing, a pillow pit, and a huge water, and is taken aback by the mention of a waterbed, something he hadn't been informed of before, and he and Lonnie panic about the additional cost. After losing a coin toss, Rand nervously tells Tommy about the extra materials needed, leading Tommy to joke about money being no object by showing a card with Mino on one side and money is no object on the other. They reluctantly agree to proceed if Tommy pays up front. However, events quickly escalate. In the garage, after Tommy flaunts a new handgun to his friends, Rand manages to secure a promise for the payment for the waterbed. But when the equipment arrives, they insist on getting paid before starting the work. Searching for Tommy, Rand instead encounters Pam in a compromising position, leading to a misunderstanding. Tommy, enraged at what he perceives as an invasion of privacy, confronts the contractors. Despite Rand's attempt to settle the payment issue, Tommy, in a sudden outburst, deems their work unsatisfactory and fires them on the spot. While having a drink, Rand suggests they should file a lawsuit against Tommy, but Lonnie argues the cost of legal action would exceed what they're owed, leading Rand to conclude that Destiny will deal with Tommy eventually. However, that night, as Rand watches an adult film featuring a construction site, he recalls leaving his toolbox at Tommy's place. He manages to talk his way back onto the property to retrieve his tools, but is confronted by Tommy armed with a shotgun on a higher floor. Tommy demands Rand leave the toolbox as security for abandoning the job, which Rand does before hurriedly leaving, only to realize he had wet himself out of fear. This triggers a memory from Rand's childhood in the 60s, recalling a distressing moment involving his dad, a strict parent who left him alone while pursuing romantic interests, resulting in a humiliating incident where young Rand wet his pants. Motivated by these memories, Rand informs Lonnie of his plan to exact revenge on Tommy, 
declares, I am karma and I'm a bitch. What follows is Rand meticulously planning his retribution. He disguises his van and monitors the comings and goings at Pam and Tommy's house for two months. Despite Lonnie's initial support, he bails on the plan at the last moment, leaving Rand to carry out the operation solo. Disguised to look like Tommy's dog, he sneaks onto the property, makes a defiant gesture towards the sleeping couple, and steals Tommy's safe. The next morning, while Tommy is puzzled by a drumstick left on the garage floor, but unaware of the break-in, Rand is in a secluded location, breaking open the safe. He sells off Tommy's firearms and some jewelry, settling all his debts with the proceeds. It's only after these transactions that Rand checks the contents of a Hi8 tape he found in the safe, leading him to contact Uncle Milty, a porn producer he knew from his brief stint in adult films. Together, they discover the tape's content, realizing it might be the most valuable item Rand has acquired. We go back two months to before Rand and Uncle Milty show the stolen sex tape. Pam is out at a club with her friends, declaring she's finished with bad boys and her next boyfriend will be boring, perhaps an accountant. To mark the start of this new phase, she buys a round of Goldschläger shots for everyone in the bar, not knowing that one of the customers is Tommy. Overhearing who paid for his drink, Tommy leaves the woman he was with and approaches Pam. Tommy, after smashing his shot glass, I'm Greek. I'm Palm, she answers. Tommy falls deeply for Pam right away. Despite her efforts to stay open to a more ordinary partner, Pam is visibly disappointed when the flowers at her hotel in Kanchun, where she's meeting with Baywatch syndicators, turn out to be from telepictures, not Tommy. Pam had told Tommy not to come to Cancun, but deep down, she hoped he would and Tommy, indeed, decided to go against her wishes. Ignoring advice from her friend Melanie Yu, who tries to remind her of past relationships with famous but unreliable men like Scott Bio, Brett Michaels, and Baywatch co-star David Charvet, Pam ends up going out clubbing again. Soon after Tommy, sharing with his friend Zach that he and Pam haven't been intimate, impulsively proposes to Pam in the middle of a nightclub. She says yes, and they get married on a beach in Mexico just four days later. Upon their return to LA, Pam moves into Tommy's Malibu home, which is about to undergo renovations. When Tommy meets Lonnie and Rand, the contractors, he announces the project's new theme, Love Deluxe, inspired by his recent marriage. Pam proposes the idea of a meditation gazebo, and Tommy agrees, claiming he meditates too, and it has made him more relaxed, although he quickly loses his cool when he sees a photographer hiding nearby. A potentially sweet moment arises when they're watching TV in bed and come across one of Pam's beloved movies, The King and I. They start singing along to Getting to Know You, which feels a bit too pointed given their situation. Meanwhile, Tommy compliments Pam's acting skills, despite the episode making it clear that musicals might not be her forte. The episode also leans heavily on montages to show the passage of time, with four in total. Two focus on dancing in clubs and two on sexual encounters. Ultimately, the story emphasizes that Pam and Tommy are happily married, enjoy a fulfilling sex life, and use a video camera to capture their most private moments. In 1995, focusing on Rand and Uncle Milty as they try to profit from the stolen video, it portrays Rand and Uncle Milty eagerly trying to find ways to make money off the tape, quickly moving from astonishment to scheming after watching it. Despite Uncle Milty's wide network in the adult film industry, their plan hits a roadblock. A series of adult content distributors turn them down, worried about legal actions from Anderson and Lee due to the lack of consent for the tape's distribution. Rand's hope that the tape would bring financial gain as retribution is dashed. Rand's frustration is palpable, leading him to damage his apartment further. Then, he receives a call from Erica, leading to a flashback of their first encounter five years prior. Rand, then a handyman, was captivated by Erica, an adult film actress. This glimpse into the past reveals that, despite being technically still married due to financial constraints, Rand remains devoted to Erica, who now lives with her girlfriend, this complicated relationship dynamic adds another layer to the story, highlighting Rand's continued attachment to Erica amidst his ongoing schemes. Erica is in need of a rare float cup valve for her ancient toilet, a part that is no longer manufactured. 
Excited by the challenge, Rand embarks on a quest to find it, making calls to numerous hardware stores with no luck. However, a light bulb moment occurs when he turns to the internet, using AltaVista to locate a shop in Ohio that has the part. Just as he's about to provide his payment details, a new idea hits him, leading him to approach Uncle Milty with a groundbreaking plan. They realize they don't need a traditional distributor to sell the Pam and Tommy video. They can do it themselves online, leveraging the early days of the internet for a cheaper and potentially anonymous distribution method. Uncle Milty, though skeptical about the details of online distribution, is intrigued by the cost-saving aspect compared to traditional advertising. He arranges a meeting with Butchie, a financier known for backing the film Deep Throat, to seek funding. Despite Butchie's initial reluctance, due to legal concerns, Rand's pitch about the anonymity and untraceability of online sales sways him. Convinced of the plan's viability, Butchie agrees to invest $50,000 under strict loan chart conditions and demands a 15 cut of the gross sales. Although Rand is uneasy about partnering with a mobster, he accepts the deal, recognizing the unique opportunity to distribute the video without traditional legal risks. This marks the beginning of their venture into the uncharted territory of online sales, despite their limited understanding of the internet's workings and legal landscape. Pam and Tommy are seen seeking a blessing for a baby from the universe, yet Pam finds out through a pregnancy test that it's not their time yet. Tommy suggests trying again immediately, but Pam has to focus on a significant monologue she's scheduled to perform on Baywatch the following day, her first major dialogue in weeks. On set, her excitement turns to disappointment when she learns her monologue has been replaced with a scene of her discovering drugs in the ocean, a change decided by the show's producers for a stronger impact. Although she outwardly agrees, she's visibly upset, retreating to her trailer. Melanie, her friend, tries to uplift her spirits by reminding her of her bright future post Baywatch, especially with her upcoming film Barbed Wire. Tommy, on the other hand, is dealing with his own set of frustrations after watching a Behind the Music episode on Motley Crue that highlights the band's decline with the rise of grunge music to cheer up Pam. He prepares a lavish Greek dinner, revealing more about his heritage and background, information that Pam finds surprisingly new despite their close relationship. When Pam shares the news about her cut monologue, Tommy is supportive and encourages her to fight for the scene's restoration, even suggesting she threatened to quit. Instead, Pam proposes a solution to shoot the monologue without her scene partner, confident they can pull it off efficiently and that the producers will appreciate having the footage. She approaches the situation with optimism, hoping for the best outcome. Rand gets dressed up and visits Erica with flowers, presenting a ring box to her. However, the box humorously contains the much-needed valve instead of a ring highlighting Rand's quirky way of showing affection. He then takes Erica out to dinner, expressing gratitude for her accidental role in inspiring him to realize his potential, although he keeps the details to himself. A flashback reveals a moment when Rand ended up performing in an adult film as a last-minute replacement due to his unexpected suitability for the role, showcasing a surprisingly tender moment between him and Erica on set, despite Uncle Milty's stern reminder to keep the scene appropriate to its setting. Meanwhile, Pam discusses her public image with Gail, her publicist for Barbed Wire, Unsure of the direction for her PR campaign, Pam mentions admiring Jane Fonda's career trajectory from an innocent girl next door to a sultry icon and then to a committed activist and entrepreneur. Gail sees this as an excellent narrative for Pam, symbolizing freedom. On a parallel note, Rand experiences his own form of liberation. He's shown working on the logistics of distributing the stolen video, setting up an operation in a covert location, simultaneously in Malibu. Pam's life seems to be taking a positive turn with a confirmed pregnancy, marking the beginning of a new chapter for her. We see a man in an internet cafe, enduring the slow internet of the era, as he finally accesses the website for Pamela's hardcore sex video. He sends a check via mail to an address in Toronto. One individual collects the checks, another records buyer information, and this data is then faxed to Rand for shipping. The process involves traditional banking and postal services, highlighting the tape's journey from purchase to delivery. Eventually, the customer receives his tape, ready for some private time, a nod to the pre-digital age's simplicity. Pam and Tommy, who are at a doctor's office for their first ultrasound, 
thrilled at the sight of their unborn child. Tommy, ever the doting partner, prepares a Mickey Mouse-shaped pancake for Pam, embracing the joys of impending parenthood. However, an accident occurs when Tommy picks up an ultrasound photo on the floor, prompting him to hide it in their safe, only to discover the safe is missing. Listing its contents to the police, Pam's realization that the tape is gone leads to a moment of panic. After the police leave, Tommy reassures Pam of their resolve to recover the tape on their own, setting the stage for their next steps. For Pam and Tommy consulting with Anthony Pelicano, a private investigator, to solve the mystery of their stolen safe. Pelicano suggests the theft could be driven by financial motives or a quest for revenge, prompting Tommy to list potential adversaries from the music world. Pelicano zeroes in on a more plausible suspect, Rand, who had installed their security system and had a messy termination of employment. This revelation leaves Pam deeply unsettled by the potential consequences of Tommy's past actions. Meanwhile, Rand's storyline reconnects with the main narrative. Alone at home, he's distracted by drugs and dreams of luxury yachts when Pelicano shows up, intent on recovering the stolen tape. Rand manages to keep quiet about his knowledge even as Pelicano threatens to come back for the tape. After Pelicano's departure, Rand attempts to reach Uncle Milty for help, only to find him unreachable, indulging in leisure and oblivious to Rand's distress. It's revealed that Rand's share of the profit from their scheme is a mere $400, money he immediately gave to Erica to settle an old debt, highlighting the disparity in their financial situations and Uncle Milty's apparent indifference to the financial struggles they face. Returning to work, Rand picks up some printed materials and learns from the clerk that his tape, minus the official packaging, is already out there. Rand finds out it wasn't through mail delivery but from a street vendor. In a Tower Records parking lot, a young seller is offering cut-rate copies of the tape. Rand, in a futile attempt to protect the rights to the content he unlawfully claimed, confronts the vendor, only to be dismissed rudely. Meanwhile, Pam and Tommy get an update from Pelicano, who assures them that someone as inept as Rand will likely surrender the tape soon. Pam's mood shifts from optimistic to shocked as she discovers her colleagues watching the tape on set, a breach of her trust. Frustrated, she and Tommy see the tape being marketed with a web address, a concept Tommy struggles to grasp until Pam, familiar with their upcoming project Barbed Wire, clarifies the idea of internet distribution. They visit a public library to access the website, a moment not mirrored by comments on the betrayal involving her Canadian roots. They share their findings with Pelicano, who has already linked Rand with Uncle Milty. Pelicano's belief in Rand's lack of criminal sophistication is reinforced by the simple fact that Rand is listed in the phone book, underscoring his amateur status in the realm of crime. In a flurry of scenes, Rand is seen dodging Pelicano and the motorcyclist sent by Tommy, while Uncle Milty, upon hearing who is after them, jets off to Amsterdam under the pretense of adjusting their bank arrangements, though it's clear he's actually fleeing from potential harm. As time goes by, Pam's worry intensifies. She attempts to make Tommy and Pelicano understand the personal impact of the situation on her. Tommy somewhat dismissively equates his experience with Pam's, leading to a heated exchange where Pam stresses that the repercussions for her are amplified by gender biases, pointing out the societal stigma she faces compared to Tommy. Despite Tommy's initial dismissal, citing Pam's prior modeling work, Pam underscores the crucial difference of consent, leading to a momentary estrangement between them. The next day brings a poignant moment as Pam and Tommy face the sorrow of a pregnancy loss, showcasing a period of deep emotional connection and support. In the midst of dealing with their grief, they confront aggressive paparazzi, culminating in an intense encounter where Pam, overwhelmed by intrusion, retaliates against a photographer. As the man speeds away, Tommy scoops up a tearful Pam in his arms and escorts her back to their vehicle. In an interview with Glamour magazine, Pam talked about her role on Barbara and stated that you shouldn't dwell on negative events. Later, she finds Tommy in their bedroom, highlighting the ongoing challenges they face, including the aftermath of the tape and a lost pregnancy. Alongside Tommy's concern over his fading music career as Pam's star is ascending. While Pam is busy with an entertainment weekly event, Tommy dwells on the decline in his band Motley Crue's album sales, from millions in the 80s to just 500,000 for their latest album. Tommy's mood doesn't improve during a night out at the Viper Room, where modern music from bands like Sleater Kinney does not recognize him, leading to a feeling of obscurity. However, recognition comes in an unwelcome form in the bathroom, where a fan praises him for the infamous tape, 
rather than his music, leading to a physical altercation. Following the brawl, Pam is summoned by her publicist, Gail, who warns her that Tommy's reckless behavior could tarnish Pam's image by association. Pam assures her it won't happen again, but hesitantly reveals the fight's cause was the tape, which she claims remains largely unknown. Gail checks the few magazines that have recently started their online versions and finds no news coverage about the tape, but discovers many websites selling it. Pam returns home frustrated, accusing Tommy of enjoying the notoriety from the tape and trying to undermine her career, which he vehemently denies, shouting about his past music sales success before leaving the room in anger. Unbeknownst to Gail and Pam, the scandal is nearing mainstream attention. The writers for Jay Leno's show are aware of the tape, but don't find it widely recognizable enough to include in their jokes. Meanwhile, LA, for Times journalist Alicia Krentz, acquires the tape and sees its potential story at the crossroads of celebrity, privacy, and the digital age. Her editor, however, brushes it off as mere gossip. Very unfazed, Alicia contacts Tommy for a statement. Despite Pam's attempts to intervene, Tommy bluntly refuses to comment on the theft and dismisses Alicia. Nonetheless, Alicia continues her investigation, obtaining the police report to strengthen her argument. Pam, seeking positivity, focuses on her desires. For the scandal to dissipate, her movie Barbed Wire to succeed, increase sales for Tommy's latest album, and hoping for another chance at pregnancy. However, Tommy bursts in with alarming news from his bandmate, Nikki Six, that Bob Gookshane, the publisher of Penthouse now possesses the tape. Tommy, aware of his rivalry with Hugh Hefner, who has featured Pam in Playboy multiple times, fears Bob Guccione will publish images from the tape in Penthouse. This concern, amplified by his recent professional setback of losing Motley Crue's recording studio to Third Eye Blind, pushes him towards legal action, despite Pam's reluctance. In a law firm's conference room, Despite Pam's objections, worrying that Guccione might not have intended to use the tape but could retaliate if sued, and that a lawsuit might only spotlight the tape further, they are advised to act first to prevent any publication. In a subsequent meeting, Guccione and his legal team decide not to shy away from the challenge to their First Amendment rights, with Guccione instructing to select and prepare 20 explicit frames from the tape for potential use. Meanwhile, at the Times, Alicia discusses the escalating situation with her editor, questioning whether the unfolding legal battle and its implications now make the story newsworthy. Gail visits Pam on the set of Baywatch to express her disappointment for not being informed first about the lawsuit. Pam attempts to justify Tommy's and his lawyer's decision, but Gail sees through it and advises Pam to stand up for herself against men. Despite Pam's hope that the news won't reach a wide audience, it lands on the front page of the Los Angeles Times' entertainment section, catching the attention of Hugh Hefner, a Baywatch producer, Nikki, the team at Lino's show, and even a cam operator in Seattle. The story has even been noticed by the reporter from Glamour, as Gail mentions in a message left for Pam and Tommy. Pam and Tommy end up watching Jay Leno joke about the tape on his show, indicating the story has become widely known. The legal battle that Pam wanted to avoid is moving forward, with Pam receiving a notice for a deposition. Tommy tries to downplay the situation, insisting they're facing it together. Yet, Pam feels uncertain, reflecting the series' underlying tension. In April 1996, Pam undergoes her deposition, accompanied only by Tommy's attorney, named Sandy. Defense attorney Bruce Hendricks aggressively questions Pam, subjecting her to humiliating inquiries right from the start such as asking her age the first time she publicly exposed her genitals. This intense deposition is contrasted with flashbacks highlighting key moments in Pam's journey to fame. One such flashback takes us to August 1989, where Pam, alongside her dismissive boyfriend Wayne, attends a BC Lions football game. Although Pam initially refuses Labatt's beer, Wayne insists on having his own, and that decision becomes fortuitous when Labatt's camera spots Pam in the crowd, leading to a spontaneous but exciting demonstration of her modeling potential. This exposure catches the eye of a Labatt's marketing VP, who offers Pam a chance to feature in a promotional poster. The narrative then shifts to Pam at a pivotal moment in her career, receiving a call from Playboy while on a break from her waitressing job. Despite her excitement, Wayne's jealousy peaks, demanding she decline the opportunity. Pam's refusal triggers Wayne to react violently, throwing an object at her, Skillfully dodging it, Pam makes the decisive move to leave, 
prioritizing her career and well-being over the volatile relationship, illustrating her resilience and determination to pursue her dreams. During her deposition, when asked by Hendricks if she views posing nude as a sexual act, the scene transitions to October 1989, with Pam arriving at the Playboy Mansion, accompanied by her mother, Carol. Feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness, Pam prepares for her photo shoot. The photographer reassures her, promising to proceed only within her comfort zone, leading to an experience Pam thoroughly enjoys. Post-shoot, Hugh Hefner takes a moment to commend Pam, telling her that talents like hers are rare and advising her to distinguish between her value and her price. This, he suggests, would allow her to embrace any role she chooses. Pam responds with a hint of irony, noting that women have long been navigating such distinctions, especially in moments like these with Hefner. This portrayal aims to underscore the contrast between Pam's consensual modeling for Playboy and the non-consensual use of her image, as threatened by Penthouse. That evening, back at their hotel, Pam confides in her mother, Carol, about considering breast augmentation, thinking about increasing by no more than two cup sizes. Carol responds with a loving affirmation that Pam was perfect as created, but playfully adds that if Pam wishes to try to top him, leaving the statement open-ended and highlighting the supportive yet complex relationship between Pam and her mother. Pam indeed went on to model for Playboy several more times after her initial shoot. Aware that Pam's compensation for her later appearances was minimally increased, Hendricks speculates that she might have sought to enhance her earnings through Penthouse. He suggests that the conflict between the publishers of the two magazines could have led Pam to consider releasing the sex tape as a strategic move to benefit financially while maintaining her relationship with Hefner. Hendricks questions if the creation of the tape with Tommy Lee was aimed at financial gain, similar to her previous ventures in adult entertainment, or if this was another tactic to challenge Pam during her deposition, pushing her to her breaking point and causing her to retract her lawsuit. Immediately after Pam refutes Hendricks's theory, an assistant brings in audiovisual equipment, indicating that Hendricks intends to have Pam watch parts of the tape during the deposition to confirm the identities of those featured, adding another layer of pressure and discomfort to the proceedings. Pam is deeply distressed when the tape starts playing during her deposition, with Sandy, her lawyer, only offering an apology for what she has to endure. This situation echoes a previous warning from Gail about Pam's lack of control in such male-dominated environments. Amidst this, a tender flashback shows Pam and Tommy by a campfire, sharing dreams of a big family in a simple life, contrasted sharply with the invasive questioning by Hendricks. He probes into intimate details of their private moments, suggesting they might have been seen by others during their personal escapades, which overwhelms Pam to the point of physical sickness in the bathroom. Even the court reporter is appalled by the nature of the deposition. In a significant flashback, Tommy mentions securing the tape, believed to possibly contain footage of their first child's conception, in a safe, treating it as a precious family memory. Back in the harsh reality of the deposition room, as Hendricks prepares to continue his invasive questioning, Sandy points out the time, hinting at a pause until another day. Pam firmly insists that she will seek new representation if the aggressive line of questioning doesn't cease. Sandy attempts to negotiate with Hendricks as Pam tries to regain her composure. Before leaving, she apologizes to the cleaner for the mess left behind, a poignant moment highlighting how Pam, affected by the actions and decisions of others, feels responsible for the turmoil surrounding her. Pam, struggling with the aftermath of a tape leak, she vehemently denies at a press conference that the leak was a publicity stunt orchestrated by her and Tommy. Then the scene moves on to the Jay Leno show. The forced to sit alongside Jay Leno, whose distasteful joke about the tape first made them aware of its widespread circulation, she must feign camaraderie for the sake of the movie's promotion. When Leno shifts from light-hearted inquiries to the sensitive topic of the tape, Pam's frustration surfaces, describing the exposure as both horrible and devastating. Despite the awkward moment, it's doubtful that Lino will alter the nature of his jokes, though he appears momentarily remorseful. Pam's commitment to the movie's promotion is the only thing preventing a confrontational response from Tommy towards Lino. The tape's release has not been advantageous for everyone involved. Uncle Milty, for one, is profiting, spending his earnings on drugs and ignoring Rand's attempts to contact him. Rand's situation deteriorates further initially, he struggled to distribute the tape for minimal financial return, but now, with the tape's success apparent, 
Butchie demands his share of the profits. Discovering Milty's absence abroad, Butchie's men capture Rand and bring him before Butchie. Demanding the repayment of $50,000, putting Rand in a dire financial predicament, Rand reaches out to Tommy Lee, the wealthiest individual he knows, with a request for $26,938. Their encounter unfolds at Dodger Stadium, separated by a fence. Rand justifies his request as compensation for his work and the tools he used. Tommy, initially intending to confront Rand physically, opiates for a psychological attack due to the barrier. He deems Rand a failure, and rather than giving him the money, decides to burn the $27,000 as a dramatic gesture, leaving Rand with nothing but the burning remains. Consequently, Rand is left to settle his debt to Butchie in a different way, tasked with collecting from a gambler entangled in a chain of debts leading back to Butchie. The offer of a small bat for self-defense does little to reassure Rand about his dawning task. In another development, Tommy's lawyer, Sandy, informs him and Pam that their lawsuit against Penthouse has been dismissed. The judge ruled that the tape constitutes newsworthy content, allowing Penthouse to publish it under First Amendment protections. Pam, having anticipated this outcome, reflects on the societal judgment she faces due to her career and previous modeling work, feeling resigned to the public perception of her. She expresses frustration at the legal system's failure to protect her privacy highlighting the fundamental misunderstanding of her plight by the men around her, including Sandy, who claims to sympathize but is met with Pam's skepticism about his ability to truly comprehend her situation. That evening, Rand comes back unsuccessful from his initial try to reclaim the gambler's money attempting this in broad daylight at a bus stop turned out to be inefficient. He then learns about the unsuccessful outcome of Tommy's legal action. This leads to a conversation about Erica and her girlfriend Danielle's thoughts on the tape after viewing it at a gathering. Erica, with her background in adult films, praises the intimate direction and the genuine emotions displayed, referring to Tommy as some kind of sensitive caveman. Yet, this positive moment is short-lived as Rand later admits to Erica his involvement in the burglary. When Rand expresses surprise at her reaction to a porn video, Erica emphatically clarifies that Pam and Tommy's private tape made without consent, is not pornography. Rand's incomprehension pushes her away even more. The series also touches on the premiere party for Barbed Wire where Pam's work is unfavorably compared to the leaked tape. Overshadowing the movie's reception, that disheartened by the negative feedback in the audience's mockery during a public screening, Pam and Tommy face a disheartening end to their evening. Meanwhile, Rand's desperation escalates as he confronts the gambler at home, using a dramatic quote and physical aggression to settle the debt, signaling his own internal turmoil. Pam and Tommy leave the movie theater, reflecting on the night's disappointments. Despite the challenges, Pam's restraint in blaming Tommy highlights the complexity of their situation, leaving the audience to ponder the consequences of actions taken by and against them. Tommy rejoins Motley Crue for a signing event at Tower Records for their new album, Generation Swine feeling reinvigorated by the interaction with fans. However, he quickly senses the skepticism of grunge enthusiasts who regard him and his band as pass. Pam, undeterred by the failure of barbed wire, is auditioning for roles in major films, including Lynn Bracken in LA, confidential a choice that seems ill-fitted given the industry's harsh judgments. She's also considering a role in a James Bond spoof by Mike Myers, aligning more closely with her acting range. However, the release of the controversial penthouse issue complicates her career, with Pam feeling scrutinized by a vast and varied audience. Tommy tries to offer comfort, but their situation worsens as Pam misses out on both LA, Confidential and Austin Powers and Motley Crue gets demoted at the VMA broadcast. Meanwhile, Rand is struggling with his role in collecting debts for Butchie. After delivering a small sum, he pleads to be released from his duties, claiming it's eroding his spirit. Butchie agrees to let him off if he can come up with $10,000. With his financial avenues exhausted, Rand faces the grim prospect of remaining in his coercive role for the foreseeable future. In a twist that reconnects the paths of Tommy, Pam, and Rand, Tommy receives a late night call from Nikki, his bandmate, prompting him to use his computer for possibly the first time to investigate the issue. To his dismay, he discovers the sex tape is being streamed online. A series of cuts shows various viewers watching the tape, leading to a scene where Rand, during a debt collection, stumbles upon someone viewing it, puzzled by its online presence. 
The situation escalates when Sandy, their lawyer, informs Pam and Tommy about Seth in Seattle, who's streaming the tape without charge as a promotional tactic for his business. Despite the previous lawsuit's emotional toll on Pam, Tommy believes they must take legal action against Seth. However, in Seattle, Seth is actually pleased by the lawsuit, seeing it as beneficial publicity. Amid these events, Rand faces his own setback when his car refuses to start. Desperately seeking answers, he consults a psychic, who suggests through a tarot reading that his misfortunes are due to wronging someone represented by the star card, which Rand associates with Pam. This interpretation leads Rand to a moment of attempted reconciliation. Seth awaits Pam and Tommy at Sandy's office. He expresses gratitude for their lawsuit, interpreting it as a green light to legally stream the tape and now wants to officially buy the streaming rights for profit. He warns that without a deal, the tape would proliferate as bootlegs online, but a paywall could significantly limit its exposure. Despite Tommy's immediate rejection of Seth's proposal, Sandy suggests reconsideration, and Pam, weary of the ongoing battle, reluctantly acknowledges the logic in Seth's argument. Yet, she refuses to entertain Seth's offer, insisting instead that the rights be given to him for free to avoid being bought. This leads to a new conflict, not just with the world but now directly with Tommy, as both their consents are required for any legal action. Amidst personal turmoil, Tommy finds Pam preparing to leave Los Angeles. He persuades her to join him on a trip to Lake Mead instead, seeking to recapture happier times. However, the attempt quickly sours as they face intrusive attention in Las Vegas. The situation escalates with a disagreement over a hotel service misunderstanding, highlighting their strained relationship. Tommy's inability to provide a peaceful moment culminates in Pam finding him socializing late in the hotel bar, further distancing her. Upon her departure from the hotel room, Tommy is left to discover she has taken the car, symbolizing a significant rift in their relationship. Watching their wedding video, Pam is met with an apologetic Tommy, who is met with a cold reception. She then demands he sign Seth's contract, triggering Tommy's anger, leading to a destructive outburst. However, he eventually signs the contract, prompting Pam to declare it's over leaving Tommy confused about her meaning. In a separate incident, Rand, attempting to make amends, declines Seth's offer to purchase the original tape until the offer matches his debt requirement of $10,000. Securing the money, Rand leaves it for Erica along with divorce papers, closing his chapter. Pam giving birth in a home setup and a symbolic changing of Pam's Tommy tattoo to Mommy. Next, Pam and Tommy get divorced but get back together after a while, but not for long. The end. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like our channel and subscribe if you enjoy content like this. Also, let us know what movie you would love us to recap for you.